Hello and welcome to this video on trepanation. This is an ancient and surprisingly effective but niche form of brain surgery. As a treatment, it has seen use and disuse throughout history, but is now back in vogue for cerebral hemorrhage. Trepanning, trephining, burr hole, and trephination, all of these refer to the same thing. That is a hole put in the skull to relieve the buildup of pressure on the brain and skull. As you can imagine, the skull being made from bone is solid and substantial. This compares to the soft, squishy goodness that is the brain. When pressure builds up and pushes on the skull, it pushes back against the brain with just as much force. As the brain is soft, it becomes crushed by the pressure. This is why a hole is put into the skull. It relieves the pressure and lets the pressure reduce. This is often done by releasing the pent-up blood. While we now know that this is the cause and treatment, ancient peoples were not necessarily as informed. Despite this, they still used what is an apparent solution to relieve certain conditions. This could have been abnormal behaviour, seizures, and blunt force trauma. It was surprisingly common and widespread practice in the ancient eras, its use dwindled over time. It did, however, remain in practice for medical, mystical, and ritualistic reasons until the early 1900s. Starting with the earliest records we have found, we can go back to what is considered the prehistoric era. Places like ancient Greece, North and South America, Africa, Polynesia, and the Far East. Records and remains from as early as 6000 BCE. That's over 8000 years ago now. We have limited archaeological evidence that they were doing this. It begins with the remains of skulls that have round holes. Sometimes they were square or rectangular, but round was the most common. While these people could have been victims of violence, the holes have begun to round over. This indicates not only survival from the process of making the hole, but enough time to begin repairing the damage. Considering when we're talking about, infection was a significant risk, and the chances of dying early on in the procedure would have been high. These signs of healing take a lot of time. When viewed in conjunction with the site, neatness, and the numbers found, it is clear that it was done for a specific purpose. While it may have been medical, it could also have been ritualistic. Later on, we see similar measures taken by the ancient Romans and the ancient Greeks. They practice this in varying forms, with Hippocrates himself reporting on it. Then we have Galen and others that are considered accurate historical recorders. Some of these were considered the forefathers of modern medicine. Going even closer to the modern time, we can see records of this occurring in Africa. This occurs around roughly the same time frame as the medieval era in Europe. That is, we find remains with the skull bone fractured and parts of it lifted out. Many of these seem to have been an effort to deal with fractures. Going further towards the modern day, we can look at the Classical and Renaissance period. In this time, some of the more ancient medical methods practiced by the Romans and Greeks were seeing a revival. This included trepanation. Some of the works were discovered from long before this, and the medical procedures described within them were considered groundbreaking and amazing. There was a degree of uh, popularity and almost mysticism about the classical era in terms of the ancient Greeks and Romans. It was thought their abilities were way beyond what was available at the time. This meant that something like trepanation, that was practiced by the ancient Greeks and Romans, was seen as a cure for a number of ailments, some of which were suitable, some of which it was not suitable for. It was practiced for the resolution of seizures and skull fractures. Although there aren't a lot of these in Europe itself, there are quite a few. The further east you go towards Russia, the more prevalent the practice seems to become. For such an invasive surgery, it's surprising from the remains we found just how high the survival rate was. There was also a degree of popularity that, going into the 16th century, 
we see the Prince Philip of Orange had the same operation performed 17 times, and one poor bastard had 52 holes put in his head within a very short window of time. You can see how there was a degree of almost romanticism about this operation, and while in some cases it was suitable, in other cases it wasn't. And this brings us closer to the modern day. In the last couple of hundred years, we've seen things like lobotomies occurring. Lobotomies were a somewhat barbaric practice, and these were done simply by cutting a hole in the skull, a trephine, then placing an instrument into the brain and destroying parts of it. This is less than ideal. For the most part, we've long since moved beyond the point of conducting lobotomies, but this doesn't mean that trepanation has lost any and all benefits. There are certain cases, and fundamentally exactly the same purpose as it was used for originally, in which trepanation is suitable, these being epidural and subdural hematomas, that is buildup of blood on the brain. In order to get that blood out, trepanation really is the only option. The distinction between the modern version of trepanation and what neurosurgeons will do nowadays is that the part of the skull taken out is taken out in a way that it can be put back. This is now known as a craniotomy, where the trepanation was drilling a hole and fundamentally destroying that part of the skull. The craniotomy is more like drilling a hole, taking out a plug of the skull, and then conducting the necessary procedure then putting it back. Looking at this, we have evidence going back thousands and thousands of years of it being conducted, both as a medical practice and to some extent as a ritualistic or mystical practice. The rationale behind it could be considered relatively similar to the bloodletting practices of the revival renaissance and into the more modern eras of the 1800s. Arguably, in ancient times, what they had available was nowhere near what we've had in the last hundred or so years. That is, when they were conducting these procedures, they would have had to have done it using stone tools, possibly harder materials made out of various metals as time went on, going from copper and bronze through to steel. We know that the Greeks and Romans were developing specialized medical instruments in order to do this, in the remains that we have found and in the historical record from that time, the industrial capacity of the Renaissance period gives rise to even more tools available, and the specialized interest in medical services also meant that doctors were specially developing instruments for putting holes in the skull. Remains found through the archaeological record and investigation of human remains indicates that there were at least five particular ways of developing these holes. Some of the earliest remains had simple rectangular cuts made. This allowed them to remove a section of the skull. Then there was tools that were meant to scrape and abrade their way through the skull itself, perhaps the coarsest of approaches. The next option available was a circular cut going around and around. This crosses over somewhat with the boring approach though that could be considered more in line with a, a drill bit of sorts. And then finally, there is the modern burr hole, which is done by drilling several holes closely to each other, and then cutting out the space in between them. The big thing with all of these approaches is that they had to be carefully done in order to not damage the brain itself. But not just the brain, you wanted to avoid damaging the dura mater over the brain and the blood vessels around it. If you damage these, you would perforate one of the brain's main protective structures and allow infection directly into the brain. And this was entirely possible, as although the skin would reform over the site that you'd taken away the bone, the hole in the skull would remain. This means that if you had managed to put a hole in the dura mater, meninges, or damage those blood vessels, there's a good chance that the brain would eventually be destroyed by infection. While it's a rare treatment now, it is used in some limited cases, but these are medical, 
we no longer drill a hole in someone's head for mystical or ritualistic reasons, or at least not in most developed societies. It is still arguably conducted for these reasons in remote or isolated communities where evidence is sparse, and historically it seems that there have been large populations that practiced it for one reason or another. Some of these were to treat identifiable disorders such as seizures, fits, headaches, blunt force trauma, and so on. In other cases, it appears to have been done particularly by shamans in response to certain perceived mystical ailments. Thank you for watching this video. If you found it interesting, consider liking, sharing, and subscribing. Please post any comments, questions, or suggestions you might have below.